Um, we've been able to detect uh, resistance to TV drugs for a long time, and with pretty good accuracy, what we've been, everyone's been trying to do is improve on the speed with which that happens. And so you can see that, uh, the, as you know, indirect testing is quite slow and is, in theory, a month or two, and in process, uh, usually six to nine months to really get data back to patients in, in developing world settings. Doing direct testing is much faster, and direct testing can be done by a number of culture methods and gets it down to three weeks or so, by liquid culture down to a week and a half or so, and then if you use phage methods or molecular methods, uh, it gets much faster yet. Um, that's quite an accomplishment and actually a, a, a great movement for the TV field, uh, which is, because of the slow growing organism, is needed in molecular advances for a long time. I'm not gonna talk about any of these, uh, except to cut, touch on one of them. Um, I'm not going to talk about any technologies that are already out there, so there's no, there's no expert in the line probe assays really in this presentation. There are a number of emerging approaches that should take off from, from where we are now. I'm going to talk about two phenotypic methods, uh, one which is intended for use peripherally and one centrally. Uh, I'll talk about a series of molecular approaches we could use and then uh, just a couple of slides about hybrid approaches that use both um, phenotypic and molecular detection. The problem uh, with most DST is that laboratory capacity in developing countries is very limited. And, uh, most countries with a high TB burden have very few laboratories that can do DST, <clears throat> partly because of all the specimen processing involved. Um, so uh, Carlton Evans and his group, um, with support from us and others, has been working on a, a colorimetric test, which is a direct test. You simply add a reagent to sputum, which liquefies it and decontaminates it. Add it direct, add that sputum directly to a quadrant plate, which has drugs in uh, through the quadrants, and has a colorimetric indicator inside the media. Leave that in the plastic Ziploc bag in, the, in an incubator, and then you can read uh, the results relatively quickly. This has a, a turnaround time of um, as fast as direct LJ, not as fast as um, as direct mo as direct midget, um, but gives you uh, impressive results. This is just finishing a feasibility study that we can uh, know soon what the results of those really are. An alternative and interesting approach has been developed by TREC, um, uh, which has now been purchased by another company, um, that is essentially an MIC, a, a standardized MIC approach. And so they develop plates. They've been doing this for a number of uh, antibiotics for a long time. So they have very standardized uh, dry down methodologies to Put, back, put antibiotics into plates, draw them down here into the bottoms of the plates, and then the uh, reconstitution is relatively straightforward. This allows the MIC uh, development in a standardized way, and they also have um, uh, loaders and readers, so it takes much of the human equation out of this. Makes it interesting for, to consider the possibility of reference laboratories around the world, instead of having to make their own media, measure their own antibiotics, make sure the antibiotics are in the fridge, etc., to just purchase these plates and do this directly. Now, one of the reasons that, we, that our people are interested in getting away from phenotypic testing, uh, besides the fact that it's expensive, slow, and, and dangerous, is that you get variable data, especially for um, some of the drugs. One of the drugs we don't expect to get variable data from is rifampin, because there's very good concordance between laboratories usually on rifampin testing. With Ambutol, we accept very high levels of variability. We know that PZA uh, has to be, you have to pay a lot of attention to how you do it, but even even uh, in comparison, even using the best methods, here you can see with rifampin, um, wild type was always seem to be susceptible, uh, but depending on which method you use, L LJ proportion, agar proportion, or radiometric midget or midget, uh, you get different results. And so here, the number of mutations that are thought to be associated with drug resistance are associated with resistance by some methods and not by others, which means that it's very hard to call phenotypic in general a standardized uh, confirmatory approach for their resistance to, to, to genotypic. As you know, Lyme probe assays have, have had a big impact. Um, the the uh, Hein group has done a very nice job of getting their assays in, uh, in, 
in use and at reasonable prices. There's a number of other groups that are now coming in to make lime probe assays. One of them is a company named Nipro, and I just put this up here because they've developed uh, in, the, in the past a, a, a multi-drug assay including PZA and now have a refined PZA assay. The previous version was on two strips, the current version is on one strip, but it, in, it includes some 47 probes that look for PNC mutations to call it non-wild type, but it also includes some of those phylogenetic mu uh, mutations that are not associated with resistance so that you don't get a false, a false call. These strips are currently um, in an evaluation uh, put together by FIND and the CDC and the Swedish Infectious Disease Control um, Institute, uh, Sven Hofner's lab, and Jamie Posey's in the lab. In addition to Lime Probe, uh, which is essentially a hybridization array, linear hybridization array, there are a number of other glass slide arrays uh, that have systems on the market or near, soon to come to market. A Coney with their gel pad array, uh, the Veritas Laboratories, um, and uh, Capital Bio. Uh, all trading, uh, you, you, you get a slightly easier readout in terms of um, uh, automation of, of the readout, but a slightly uh, sometimes heavier footprint in terms of the technology. Of course, where we are with uh, expert is uh, a big advance because of the closeness to patient and the speed. And we'd like to capitalize on that or uh, enhance uh, its impact. Um, Alir is another group that has been funded now by the Gates Foundation to come up with a competitive assay. I uh, apologize for the typo, the point if care, and then it's supposed to be point of care. Um, I'm sure we all care, so we'd like to get that right. Um, Alir is not the end of the story. I'm sure this is a slide just showing a number of uh, handheld or small uh, portable PCR technologies or platforms uh, that could be put to use for, for, for TB. In fact, many of these have TB on them already or uh, in development. You'll hear about one of them, Quantum DX, uh, uh, in the next session of talks. But you have to put chemistries on those, um, on those instruments and we have to choose between them. In the old days, figuring out if there was a SNP somewhere and, uh, and required doing capillary electrophoresis, a little specific PCR, um, uh, polynucleotide conformational changes, etc. Those all require going into your amplification tube and pulling out the amplicon, which is messy. Um, uh, Whitworth developed some technology in 2003 that uh, allowed you to distinguish uh, uh, SNPs inside double-stranded DNA by doing uh, high-resolution melt curve analysis. Uh, taking advantage of the um, differences of, of uh, uh, that were uh, the difference of bonding strength at different temperatures, whether or not there were mutations present. Uh, if you use an asymmetric PCR and develop excess single-stranded DNA, you can use probes. Um, this is an example from David Alon's lab. We're using sloppy beacons, which are large, uh, larger molecular beacons where you can cover um, larger sections of uh, of the genome. Uh, and showing here that you can get mutants distinguished from wild type, mutants of several types distinguished from wild type, depending on the TM of the, of the um, hybridized probe. Um, Larry Wong and his group uh, uh, in Brandeis has developed a very interesting um, technology called Lights On, Lights Off. He's in the audience, uh, so you can ask him more questions about this. It's a little bit hard to wrap your head around the first time you see it. Um, but there are two types of probes here, uh, probes that have a floor on them and just quencher probes that have no uh, floor on them. When these, you can use multiple probes and lay down across a relatively long stretch of single-stranded DNA. He uses um, a, a, something called late PCR, which is an asymmetric, an asymmetric PCR that gives you large amounts, uh, efficiently large amounts of single-stranded DNA. You can lay these across your area of interest and then they will develop a signature pattern of fluorescence uh, with melt, uh, and as you, uh, if you have a SNP in there, obviously you get a slightly different sequence, a slightly different uh, signature curve on that basis. Uh, the, last, um, the last molecular technology I'll talk about is something from C-Gene, which uses uh, an interesting approach here of trying to make sure that they're not crowding in your, in your temperature space and that you don't need very high resolution or you don't get read errors because of um, SNPs that have give you approximate uh, values for TM. Here, they what they do is um, use a primer here, and then the uh, exonucleus activity of the polymerase cleaves off a secondary probe that's built onto something called a pitcher, which hybridizes further down. 
in, um, in the three prime direction, that transfer, then that picture sits down, hybridizes to a catcher, which is a specific engineered sequence um, with, that gives you a, a known TM when you get a double stranded segment. Um, those you can build in different with different TMs, different sizes, um, uh, and you get very good distinguishing uh, distinctive patterns, maybe up to five degrees apart per each um, per each uh, probe. So as you can see here, you can crowd a fairly large number of uh, of probes onto a single uh, into a single uh, run. The last. The last technologies I'll talk about are a couple of um, hybrid hybrid technologies. Why would you use a phenotypic method plus a genotypic method? Well, one is because we have no limited sensitivity for some of the um, molecular uh, methods or some of the drug targets, and for others we don't have the drug targets at all. The PAS, cyclosarin, methionamide, etc. Um, so you could uh, and PZA is difficult to do. So the first one I'll talk about very briefly is the PZA one. <laughs> One minute, fine. Huh? This is my next to the last slide. Then. The um, this is a well, I won't tell you about it. Then they just amplified PNCA, <laughs> put it directly into a weed germ uh, uh, assay, and, and produced um, the transcript and made. Uh, well, I won't talk about it. The one I will talk about. <laughs> one I will talk about is um, this is a, a, a technology from Sequela, uh, and they have just um, licensed it out, so it may be developed. And this is a, a method of simply using phage infection to infect the, the bacteria. The phage replicates, gives you a burst, and gives you that mean that gives you a nice sensitivity boost. As well, it has engineered into it uh, a so what they call an SGM, an SML generation module, which is not present in the original phage that, is, that you that you uh, use for the infection experiments because there's a splicing and cleaving section, so you get a new sequence that didn't exist before. You can amplify that, um, and it won't have any contamination carryover from your initial phage. So they can then make an array of drugs, um, use a sensitizer plate, expose all the, uh, uh, expose all the, the TB organisms, extract, do an amplification, and report 12 drug differences. Thanks very much. Thank you.